Welcome back. This is Dr. Jing Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today, we're going to go to part two of gastrointestinal disorders. In the board behind me, we're going to explain some of the clinical signs and symptoms of GI issues. Last week, we talked about all these different mechanisms that might cause uh, or uh, what appears to cause symptoms outside of the GI tract. So if we have some pro problems, let's say of eczema, right, which is a skin issue, it may actually be related to GI issues or food sensitivities. So in the clinical practice, when a patient comes in, we have to ask certain questions. What is going on with this patient? Is it a true GI symptom or is it other factors that create problems for this patient? So when we look at it in terms of clinical signs and symptoms, it's not just about stomach pain when we talk about gastrointestinal disorders. When we look at it, we have to do one, does the patient have a healthy diet and lifestyle? Do they actually live a clean, um, stress-free life with um, proper foods that are organic and avoiding foods that create inflammation? Foods like gluten and dairy are big factors in GI issues. So when we look at a patient, one of the first things we like to do, which is our foundational piece, is to say, do they have a healthy diet and lifestyle? If not, we have to go ahead and modify those, right? Uh, refined sugars, gluten and dairy, sometimes soy can be problems. Um, and some patients, it can be lectins, like nuts and seeds can be problems for those patients. So alcohol use can also um, create um, a breakdown of the gut barrier and creates a uh, depletion of B vitamins. So you have to look at lifestyle factors, right? So it's very important to look at that as a foundational piece. So when someone comes in, they are eating a lot of sugar and their stress is out of control, they're drinking alcohol and their food is basically pizza, burgers, and whatever else they can grab uh, on the go. Then those are easily modifiable if the patient is willing to change, right? The, when it becomes more complicated is when you go a little bit deeper into what's going on with the patient. So does a patient have autoimmunity? Do they have immune response to their own self tissue, right? Some patients have hypothyroid or uh, the number one cause for hypothyroid might be Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So if you have inflammatory processes where your body is creating uh, an immune response to its own tissue. Uh, in cases of um, GI issues, it can be Crohn's disease, uh, it can be celiac disease, but there are other autoimmune diseases that can be affected, like rheumatoid arthritis, where it affects the joints, or psoriasis, or skin, right? So we have to ask those questions. Is it affecting our intestinal barriers? Uh, is it affecting our brain? our enteric nervous system and breaking down that nervous system. So we have to look at it in terms of, does a patient have autoimmune issues? Next is neurological. Do we have decreased output of the nervous system, right? Um, more commonly, what we call the vagus nervous system, cranial nerve 10. When we look at this, cranial nerve 10 goes down into the GI tract and innervates a lot of the organs right? And your large intestine, small intestine, etc. So if your vagal function is not uh, at optimal, then you may develop constipation. You may develop um, slow metabolism or absorption in the GI tract. So we have to look at vagus output. And then something called dysautonomia, or sometimes POTS, uh, it can create issues where your sympathetic system, the parasympathetic and, and uh, sympathetic systems are unbalanced, right? Usually it's this high levels of sympathetic drive with these patients, right? If you're under a lot of stress or scared, right? Uh, or in a crisis mode, you're not really thinking about eating, right? Because the digestion will not be there. So your balance of your autonomic system is very important. Also neurodegeneration, just people who have maybe Parkinson's early on or Alzheimer's early on, uh, this is neurodegenerative and patients don't realize that the brain output is affecting GI function, okay? 
Next thing we ask about is metabolite, uh, met, uh, metabolic conditions. Things like diabetes. Does a patient have issues with diabetes? Are they type 1, type 1.1, 1.5, or type 2 diabetic? So we look at, does diabetes drive some of these, these issues? Sometimes obesity will drive that because um, the uh, adipose tissue will create different hormones or imbalance of hormones. Hypothyroid. Okay, you're, if, you, if you don't have enough level, uh, proper levels of thyroid hormone, then everything can slow down. Uh, GI function, gallbladder function, all these things can be uh, affected. Another one is pathogens. Pathogens are infections of the GI tract. One of the most common infections uh, in the world or in the United States for GI is H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori. This is a very common infection which decreases stomach acid which can create malabsorption in, in the stomach or breaking down of the proper foods, right? If you can't break down your proteins and your fats and your carbohydrates, then it will not be absorbed properly. So we're looking at um, uh, pathogens like H. pylori. There are other pathogens like worms and uh, overgrowth of yeast and fungus and so forth. So pathogenic uh, tests would be important. So when we look at it, we have to ask the clinical questions. Also, their medications also create problems. So if you, certain medications create malabsorption issues, um, then you're not getting the nutrients, right? Or some uh, medications might affect gut lining and starts to kind of break down the gut lining and create a quote unquote leaky gut, right? So it can create a lot of different problems. So in the clinical practice, So when a patient comes in, right, um, I think a lot of practitioners miss this component is that when a person comes in, they go, oh, I have stomach pain or I have eczema, right? They don't do the necessary workup. They don't look at the patient as a whole individual. So first we've got to look at chief complaint, right? We take our time looking at what is the history? What led this person to come into our office? What is the long history of things? Was there a lot of antibiotic use that uh, decimated the gut lining? Are they on antacids for years and years and years? Are they drinking a lot of alcohol, right? Was there a trauma, like a head trauma or a concussion, right? These are all important factors in terms of understanding why a patient might have GI issues. So the chief complaint is very important. Obviously, dietary history. What is their diet like? Right? Do they eat at appropriate times? Do they eat the right types of foods? Are they just eating a lot of sugar or um, maybe just eating a lot of gluten and they might uh, not realize they have gluten sensitivity or they might even have celiac disease, right? And then we also use clinical forms, right? Rather than spend, you know, two hours asking these questions, we have extensive forms in our office where we ask the patient to fill those out at home. And it'll take maybe 30 to 45 minutes to an hour for some patients to fill those forms out because we have to ask all the necessary questions and uh, leave no stone unturned, right? So we have to kind of figure out what is going on with this patient. And then we, when we get the clinical history, when we get the medical history, right? Then we start to look at what is going on. We look at the patient, is their skin, uh, color okay? Is it power, right? Is it um, uh, full of rashes? Do they have rosacea? Do they have eczema, right? Do they look malnourished, right? Um, they're eating, but they're, they look very malnourished. They look like they haven't eaten in a, long, in a long time. It creates problems. Those are signs of malabsorption. Does a patient have neurodegeneration? Are they very forgetful? Did they lose their sense of smell? or taste, right? Is their balance off? We look at all these neurodegenerative signs. And then do they have history of autoimmunity? Do they have rheumatoid arthritis or hypothyroid? These are all things you have to look at in a patient. Does their thyroid look puffy or a little bit swollen? You have to ask those questions, but you also have to clinically observe what is going on with that patient. Is the patient's handwriting very small or is it very large? Or is it very shaky? All those things matter 
in terms of looking at a patient from beginning to end. In the physical exam, right? We have to do the physical exam. Oftentimes, uh, doctors are forgetting the art of the physical exam. You know, listening to their lungs, listening to the uh, bowel sounds, right? Palpating the thyroid, doing a neurological exam. You have to be able to do that and put it all together to find a solution for those complex patients who have GI issues or GI related symptoms, which they are unaware of that is related to GI. Or sometimes it's just neurodegeneration, right? Or uh, degenerative processes that affect the enteric nervous system. So you gotta look at the physical exam uh, findings. Then we like to run labs, right? I often find uh, patients come in and they're, they get labs from their primary. And oftentimes it's just, you know, cholesterol uh, and maybe a CBC, right? It's not comprehensive enough sometimes. So our routine blood work, uh, we like to look at a whole panel of things and look at if the patient has inflammation, do they have thyroid issues, uh, is their homocysteine levels up, right? Do they have um, vitamin D levels that are appropriate? So when we do our routine lab work, it can help us determine what direction to go. Sometimes the routine blood work will pick up things um, that was missed on maybe smaller panels. So routine blood work is very important. When we look at GI, there's a lot of invasive testing uh, involved also, right? Endoscopy, colonoscopy, biopsies. You can do all these types of um, invasive tests to figure out what's going on. And you need that sometimes to rule out pathology. Do we have a, a physical issue, right? Um, the other uh, form of testing that we use is uh, what we call functional medicine specialty labs. So this is looking at um, food sensitivities. We use a company called Cyrex Labs, and they look at different types of foods, right? But they look at it in terms of either cooked and uncooked foods, because uh, the protein of that food will change when it's cooked. So looking at food sensitivity is very important. Looking at autoimmunity is also very important. Sometimes doing a stool pathology test would be very important. In our, in our office, we use something called um, a GI map, and we look at the gut microbiome, but we also look at uh, all the different types of infections that can be possible in the GI. And the way we did, they, uh, this lab does it is through DNA testing, right? Not just look at it in a microscope and say, do we have a worm? Uh, they look at DNA fragments and looking at DNA material of bad bacteria or um, pathogens, right? So it's important to do that if we have an unresolved GI issue. So oftentimes patients come in and they've done invasive testing because they've had longstanding issues um, for their GI. So they've been to doctor, to doctor, to doctor, they've been to gastroenterologist, and they go to a dermatologist because they have skin issues, and then they go to a neurologist because their cognitive abilities are, are, are declining. So they've been to many doctors prior to coming into our office. And our job is to kind of put all that together, add in some uh, additional testing, look at a comprehensive case review, and then determining what is the next course um, for this patient? What is the next step? And usually the foundational piece needs to be in place, which is diet, nutrition, and lifestyle, right? Foundational stuff. Then we can build on that and say, what else can we do? So in our office, we take a really comprehensive approach to GI dysfunction, right? Um, if you have any questions, list it below. And my name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence means excellent results. And we'll see you guys next week for part three of gastrointestinal disorders. Have a great day.